All right, folks, we are ready. Um, thank you for coming to this session. Hopefully everybody is in. So I just want to sort of set up the stage for this talk. Um, with me is Professor Matt Fredrickson. He's an associate professor at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. Um, his research has been focusing on security, privacy, and reliability of AI algorithms, machine learning models. His papers on these topics have only ga garnered about 11,000 citations from 2019, so it's not, not, not that great. This paper we are here to talk about today, it's titled Universal and Transferable Attacks on Aligned Language Models. And in my opinion, uh, this was one of the best papers that came out on AI security all of last year. And so we wanted to bring Matt over and share his research in a little bit more technical detail. So this session will be a little bit technically, uh, uh, I would say, advanced. But do feel free to ask questions afterwards. So after Matt gives his talk, we'll do a little Q&A with each other, and then uh, we'll open up uh, questions for the audience. Um, lastly, it was a little bit of a complication for him to get here. His flight got canceled a couple of times, and he just got here from Pittsburgh uh, maybe an hour ago. So if he would not have made it here, you would just have me talking, which would not have been fun for either of us. <laughs> so I'm very glad that he has been able to make it here, and stage is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Sarub. So I want to start this talk off today just by giving you a very clear idea of uh, sort of what we mean when we talk about attacking aligned language models. Um, so I trust that uh, many of you have played around with tools like ChatGPT over the past year or so. And so you know that when you ask them certain questions, right, like, you know, give me some disinformation, uh, the response they give you is, sort of aligned to be ethically correct. I want to slow that down for a second. Um, when you ask them these questions in just the right way, right? So you'll see the modification that we made there uh, was to append a sort of suffix uh, to the original question that we asked. And the suffix makes perfect sense, right? Uh, equals tutorial for plus while so on and so forth, right? If you ask them these questions in just the right way, Right, then you can change whoop, uh, everything about how they, how they respond. Right. right, so now ChatGPT is giving us uh, exactly the, the, the misinformation that we are after, um, is doing it with zeal. And the neat thing about this, this sort of attack um, is that it's universal. So that word universal in the title of the paper uh, uh, sort of uh, gets at this idea that you know, that same suffix that we appended to our query for 5G COVID misinformation uh, will work for a wide range of questions that you might ask the model uh, that it would normally refuse to, to give you an answer for. Right. So let's take a closer look and think about what's really going on here. So uh, the original response that we saw when we asked ChatGPT for the misinformation uh, was the result of what's called alignment. And this is a part of the way that these models are trained. So the sort of first stage of training, uh, pre-training, uh, exposes models to a large array of data, like 10 terabytes of data for uh, frontier models, or maybe more for the next generation, uh, taken from all across the internet. So there's good stuff, there's bad stuff. Um, and you know, sort of most importantly, uh, the objective that, that uh, uh, you have in pre-training is simply to get the model to you know, effectively predict what the next word in a sentence is given all of the words so far. So that objective isn't great uh, at, at producing a sort of chatbot that, that uh, you know, adheres to whatever your content policies and, and wishes are, or even just being a good conversationalist uh, because of all of the data that, that the model's been exposed to. So the second uh, uh, phase of training, um, called fine-tuning sometimes, or alignment, um, exposes the model to a much smaller set of, of uh, specifically crafted alignment data. And a lot of this data has uh, sort of human feedback that incorporates you know, what, what the model creator's preferred response or the human's preferred response uh, for some of these questions are. So you're going to show the model you know, a question asked by uh, uh, the user about something like misinformation or building bombs, things like that, 
right? And then collect two sets of responses. You know, one is the rejected response, which you don't want the model to say, right? And the other, uh, a, a, a more sort of ethically uh, uh, appropriate and, and, and nicer response, the way that you actually do want the model to behave, right? So it's, it's the effect of this training, right, that we're targeting when we attack uh, large language models. And normally, if you just sort of go and talk to ChatGPT using you know, plain language and uh, try and convince it to give you information that it was aligned to avoid giving you, um, it's pretty effective at, at refusing and sort of changing the subject and shifting things. Um, but what we saw in, in the video uh, was a sort of demonstration that uh, while the models can learn this alignment, Right, the sort of alignment policy that, that the uh, people who uh, create the model have in mind, um, they aren't good at actually enforcing it as a policy. So when you probe the model adversarially and intentionally try and get it to uh, break free of, of, of this part of the training, uh, it's, it's generally possible to do that. Okay. So how do we attack alignment? Well, if you think about a machine learning model, and, and this applies to any machine learning model, not just uh, generative language models and things like that, if you think about it functionally, um, it's, it's you know, this piece of code that maps uh, whatever data you give it to a probability distribution of the possible outcomes, right? And the outcomes here for language models are the next token, right, that you would expect to see in the sentence. So if I'm an attacker then, what I essentially want to do is maximize the probability of you know, some desired outcome, uh, whatever I want the model to do, um, given you know, the data that it was exposed to, uh, plus some changes that I'm going to make, call that delta here. And on its face, you know, this is one way to frame the problem, but it doesn't seem to make it any easier for the attacker, right? You know, how am I going to maximize that? I'm going to have to have some trick because the search space is very large. And luckily, uh, the function, the model itself, is mostly differentiable. Right? For a language model, sort of everything up to the, the original sort of input tokens, uh, the, the words that the model is, is shown, um, all the computations that it does is, are differentiable. So what that means is uh, we can take gradients on this model, um, and, and there is you know, a, a rich and and uh, effective literature on, on doing uh, gradient-based optimization, gradient-based search, right, to find solutions uh, that solve, solve problems like this. And so uh, the sort of like most technical contribution uh, made in this paper um, is, is a way of sort of mixing in a bit more discrete optimization to deal with the fact that, you know, we can't, we can't take gradients past discrete tokens Right? And, and solve these problems uh, computationally um, in, in a reasonable amount of time. Okay. So what do we actually optimize for here? Uh, what we found was, you know, if you want to break a chatbot's alignment for you know, whatever content policy it, it has implemented, uh, then what you want to do is, is solve this optimization problem to optimize for um, an affirmative response. So instead of the model saying, I'm sorry, I can't help you, or as, as an AI, you know, I have to be ethical, uh, optimize for an outcome that starts with sure or certainly or something like that. Um, but that isn't quite enough. If you just optimize for the first affirmative word, uh, then what a lot of models will do is say, sure, I'd be glad to help you with that. But unfortunately, I'm an aligned language model, and so on and so forth, and it'll sort of revert back to its, uh, to its policy. So what we did was uh, sort of set up uh, these optimization problems uh, to uh, 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 solve for a, an outcome uh, that goes a bit further than that. So instead of just saying sure, right, you would start with whatever, you know, some kind of model reasonable response um, if the model were willing to help you out uh, with whatever, whatever request you had was, right? So, you know, we're optimizing for the yellow tokens. We start, start out with, some arbitrary assignment, all exclamation marks, something like that, um, and do this sort of combined gradient, gradient-based and discrete optimization routine uh, to find values for those yellow tokens that cause you know, the probability of the model generating or thinking that the right most likely next thing um, is this affirmative response. 
Okay, so this is how you do it if you have access to uh, a, a language model. So you have its weights, you can take gradients of it and so forth. Um, and you just want to make that one model output one particular thing. If you want a universal uh, attack, uh, then you take the same, the same routine um, and just add in terms for, for a variety of prompts. And so we find that uh, doing somewhere between like 15 and 25 uh, prompts simultaneously, so you want one suffix that will get the model to affirm on all 15 to 20 of those, Right, that's generally enough to get uh, a single suffix that'll work for a wide, a wide range of, of harmful outcomes. Right. Um, if you want to attack a model like ChatGPT, a proprietary model, which when we did this work, we, you know, we still do not have any privileged access to it, um, nor any of the other proprietary models that we looked at, uh, the remarkable thing that we found was that all you have to do is now, start with whatever your objective was before, either for a single prompt or multiple prompts, uh, and just attack several uh, uh, white box sort of open source language models simultaneously. So effectively, you're finding a string uh, that, will, that will break you know, between three and five uh, white box generative language models um, across all the prompts in your data set. Right? And if you do that, and this takes a while, um, on like one, one node of, of uh, eight or 10 A100s takes on the order of like 12 to, to 24 hours to, to find this in most cases. What you get in the end is uh, a, a suffix um, that you can then take to ChatGPT or you know, BARD or, or whatever um, and, and break the alignment that, that those uh, much larger black box proprietary models uh, are, are implementing. And we measured this on a test bench of uh, roughly 500 harmful behaviors, right? And what we're looking for here to sort of evaluate the success of this attack is how often, um, in, in all of these cases, you generally don't have uh, uh, affirmative responses coming from the model, maybe 2% or 8% for OpenAI's models. Uh, the rest refuse on every single one of the uh, requests in this test bench. Um, how often can you actually get them to affirm? Um, and this data is, is now a little bit stale. We need to rerun everything on the current generation of models that are out there. Uh, but as of you know, August, September, uh, this is what we were looking at. For GPT 3.5, we, we could and, and can still uh, you know, pretty easily find universal strings that, that cause the model to answer. Um, you know, for, for Palm 2, which at that point was stood up by Bison, um, I'm sorry, uh, for BART, which at that point was set up by Palm 2, um, we could do pretty well. Anthropics models uh, couldn't do as well. For Claude 2, what we found was uh, the, the, the suffixes on their own generally weren't enough to get it to, to, to sort of ignore its, its, uh, its tuning. Um, but with you know, a bit of additional manual tuning of, of whatever the algorithm came up with, um, we could generally get Claude 2 as well to, uh, to violate its alignment. So, you know, what's the big deal here, I guess? Uh, one of the reasons that we came forward with this research, released our source code um, after, you know, talking with all these model vendors um, was, you know, I, I, I believe that the current generation of, of language models, the ones we have up here, um, the amount of harm that you can do by breaking their alignment, right, when they're being used as chatbots is relatively limited. But I think that there's a lot more risk moving forward. Um, and the way that people are, are, have already started using uh, a lot of these language models, and I think will continue to, and do so in new and interesting, innovative ways, um, incorporates tools and external functionality um, into the language model. Gives the model the ability to act autonomously or semi-autonomously, semi sort of calling these tools and you know, having effects on systems or the real world or what have you. And this sort of combined with what we just saw, I think presents a huge open problem uh, that we need more research, right? And we need to find ways of actually making the results practical um, and, and uh, uh, making it accessible to people who want to incorporate these models with tools into their systems. 
But just to give you kind of a more concrete idea of what can happen when you, when you uh, equip a GPT with, with tools, uh, there was a sort of case study on uh, 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 Johan Regier's blog, um, Embrace the Red, about a year ago, so it's starting to get dated. This was back when ChatGPT had plugins. So he was playing with ChatGPT, um, giving it access to you know, web searches um, and also the ability to read his emails. So he starts by just saying, go retrieve and summarize the contents of this web page. What happens when, when the model sort of retrieves it with the plugin, views it, it says, you know, AI injection attempt succeeded. Now I'm gonna go check your inbox, right? So he uses uh, the, the email plugin to do that. Okay, he's read the first email. And then uses web search again to sort of take the contents of that email URL encode it, and send it back to, to the original website. So basically just gave ChatGPT access to his inbox, right? And uh, that combined with being able to make external uh, web queries uh, turns out to be a big problem. Okay. And just so you know, or you know, to kind of probe even a bit deeper, the contents of the original website, right, um, were sort of partially legitimate or kind of a mock-up for a website, uh, but also contained instructions that were written as though they came from the person who's interacting with the chatbot, right? Kind of a classic prompt injection uh, sort of a setup. Okay, so what do we do about this? Well, first of all, learn your lesson. Uh, don't trust ChatGPT with your inbox and a whole bunch of other tools at the same time. Uh, just doesn't seem like, like a, a very wise thing to do at the moment. Um, luckily, this was a fairly easy thing to fix, and this is, I think, a pretty common template you know, model of how you would address uh, the risk of a prompt, prompt injection vulnerability um, in, in your system. Basically, require you authenticated user input uh, before you take an action like letting the model uh, read from your inbox. Okay. So problem solved, but you know, I think that there's still a really big problem here. Right, which is essentially we have this confused deputy that we haven't made any attempt to, to fix, right? So we have this thing that's sort of sitting inside the system. Uh, it, it doesn't sort of, it doesn't know how to recognize when you're giving it instructions or somebody else is, right? And you can do a lot with kind of systems level uh, mitigations that you place on your plugins and guardrails around the model, but as long as you have this confused deputy in your deployed system, Right? You can expect there to be issues. So why is it that uh, we have this in the first place? Well, it seems that uh, language models, and in particular these conversational language models that are deployed as chatbots, are really bad at separating um, instructions, the sort of you know, code that you give the model to, to go off and do things, uh, from data, right? And data here, in this example, was whatever data came back from the, the web query. Um, it could be data that comes back from a function call, things like that. Uh, but basically what, what the model is going to see when you run a case like this is of course initially the user's instruction, then the model generates you know, function call, go get the price of the stock. Um, and if the uh, response comes back with instructions in it, right, then without some additional alignment essentially, Right? The model is, is prone to interpret that as an instruction that came from the user and go ahead and follow it. Okay. And of course, the natural solution to fixing this is to teach the model right, that it shouldn't follow instructions that come back from rag retrievals or function calls or things like that. Right? And you know, essentially what that process is to teach the model that it shouldn't do that um, is alignment once again. And you know, sort of looking at this uh, doesn't inspire a ton of uh, confidence that you know, we have a way out of this to unconfuse the deputy and, and fix problems like this when we give LLMs tools. And the sort of reason is that I've been studying this for a while, right? So back in 2014, there was this excellent paper by Christian Segetti and, and uh, many others uh, that discovered this weird phenomenon um, of deep neural networks, and they were looking at vision models, 
right? Where basically when you take an image that the model correctly predicts, this is my student's dog, Loki, um, and add a small, you know, very calculated perturbation to the image, you can get the vision classifier to predict it as whatever you want, right? And these are, you know, generally imperceptible. Um, but under the hood, sort of the, the way that you would go about doing this is exactly the way that we found uh, the suffix for our, for our sort of harmful request to the model, right? What we found were adversarial examples. They were just adversarial examples for language models and not images or some other continuous domain, right? But it seems like, and every kind of modality that we've, we've applied uh, deep neural networks to, we found that adversarial examples are present. They remain a problem. Okay. So that was 2014. It's 10 years later. What happened in between? Well, a bunch of research on trying to solve this problem happened. Right? People, you know, mainly in the context of computer vision, um, but people spent a lot of time trying to find ways to essentially align models and get them to be smarter than uh, these attacks to ignore whatever the perturbations that the attacker calculated and put in the data were, right? And we haven't we haven't made it that far, right? It's 2024, 10 years after we found the problem, and there's still a 30% penalty on accuracy if you want to do robust image classification, as opposed to vulnerable image classification, I guess. And to sort of add insult to uh, to parent injury. Um, the threat model that we're talking about here is still wildly unrealistic, right? We're talking about making very small, imperceptible changes to images, right? When in the real world, when you go to deploy a vision model, uh, the amount of freedom that the attacker has to make changes to your data um, are, are much more dramatically uh, sort of unchained than this. Right? So this is kind of a grim picture, right? We haven't found a way to solve this problem despite you know, investing lots of time and, and resources into it. But there are a few glimmers of hope for language models in particular uh, that I kind of want to end on, right? And this sort of comes from uh, something we noticed after generating lots of these examples, especially ones that transfer uh, to proprietary models. You know, if, if you look at the, the suffix part, so I, I should have highlighted this, but the cultivating Ebola virus is obviously the harmful, harmful prompt, and the rest is the attack, right? You often see things like this, a certain neutral perspective, kind of an interpretable instruction embedded within the kind of random, seemingly meaning, meaningless tokens that you're adding for your attack, um, and the model follows these. So uh, this a certain neutral pers perspective um, would tend to sort of uh, you know, produce responses that, you know, if the attack works, you're still gonna get instructions, but maybe the model will give you like a balanced response. So like a safe response, and then the one that you're after is the attacker. So why does this matter? Well, this particular example, this prompt was generated by a, an LLM. Right? So we've been generating lots of these attacks. We have hundreds of thousands of them. We train an LLM to generate uh, these adversarial suffixes, um, and they work, right? So this attack actually, as of like three weeks ago, uh, broke GPT 3.5 and very stochastically, sometimes uh, more uh, larger, more sophisticated models than that. Right? So basically, we've, we've demonstrated that we're able to generate these attacks. We're able to, so there are some statistical patterns in the attacks themselves that can be learned, right? And if you can learn to generate those, Right, then there's hope that you can also learn to recognize them um, and, and take appropriate action when you see them. So we played with this as well, uh, using our corpus of, of generated attacks from lots and lots of different models, basically rolled them into uh, the fine-tuning sort of alignment steps of, of, uh, of model training, um, and the results are indeed very encouraging. So, working with a fine-tuned version of Llama 3 displayed here. Um, what I expected to see here was kind of the same picture that we saw with vision models for the past you know, seven, eight, nine years, uh, but that's not what is coming through. Um, not only do we not have a reduction in capability, right? so the model actually on benchmarks uh, seems to do better than the model we started from, Right? But when we expose it to our sort of battery of all the 
state-of-the-art black box and white box attacks, um, it's able to, to resist them and, and give you the, the correct sort of a line generation uh, in return. Um, this is just kind of a more granular uh, radar plot of uh, the model's performance on multi-turn interactions, um, but I think, I think the point remains. However, these results cover the current state-of-the-art attacks. So whatever has been published that sort of think is, is worth adding to our, our uh, regress regression suite is in there. Um, I'm under no delusion that this model is absolutely secure, that somebody won't be able to come along in the future and find a new sort of attack vector, a more clever way of doing the optimization, um, and find a way to break it. Okay. So uh, what do we take away from this? Well, deploying uh, machine learning components in adversarial settings remains deeply challenging. Essentially, we've known about things like adversarial examples for a while, um, and the story is no different with you know, even very large, sophisticated uh, generative language models. Right? If you want to do something about your deployment right, with, with a language model, um, it does seem like you know, there is hope uh, to have a robust, secure deployment of these, you know, even in situations where you might have tool use and untrusted data hitting the, the language model, and function calls and websites and so forth. Um, but to sort of convince yourself that, that you're there, right, I think uh, doing sort of continuous integration with ongoing adversarial evaluation um, is what you have to do. Uh, the research literature is going to evolve on this quickly. Right? It has already for a while. I think it'll, if anything, speed up. Uh, so whatever your evaluation is sort of has to track progress uh, with, uh, with, the, with the current latest research. Right? And the better job you can do kind of tailoring your adversarial evaluation to the specific kind of scenarios and applications that you want to deploy the model in, uh, the better, right? If, if you just sort of take an off-the-shelf static data set, run it through your model, and it doesn't really resemble what the model is going to be exposed to, you know, you maybe shouldn't be surprised if, uh, if things don't go as well as you'd hoped, right? Um, but if you do this and you do it well, right, then the results that I showed you on the previous slide, we're able to take all this data and two and llama three, um, roll it back into uh, the model operation, right, seems to be a promising, effective way to, to build robust behavior. All right. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators on this work. Um, not all of these are collaborators on the original paper, but um, have been involved in the follow-up work on you know, robust training and, and, uh, and, and other things since then. Um, as I said earlier, all, all the source code and, and data that we have for this is, is on a website. Um, please check it out, visit, and um, I'd be happy to, to take your questions. Well, let him take the question first. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you want to have a seat? Mm -hmm. Get the mic on. So, um, great. Uh, I think I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm Saurabh Shintre, and I'm a uh, fellow student at the same lab that my uh, works at now, but I'm also a founder in the AI security space, and so is Matt. So if anybody's interested in securing, you can come talk to us, or if you are venture capital, you can talk to Matt, not to me. Um, no, this is, this is a great talk, and I think what I really liked, uh, by the way, I apologize to people who are sitting there, we couldn't find an optimal setting for this. Uh, one thing I really liked about your paper was that it took this art and trial and error that was in the early days of prompt engineering where people were just throwing things at the model and seeing what breaks into almost a science, right? Where you are taking these models, their parameters, and almost using math to uh, break them. Where do you see from your perspective the, the path forward for prompt injection attacks? Do you expect them to continue to be on that like trial and error? I'm gonna ask the same question in French, I'm gonna ask the same question in uh, Shakespeare. Or do you think it is going to breaking these models, attack, attacking these models and agents and whatever people build, will become almost like the science that in some sense malware research has become? Yeah, um, that, that's an excellent question. Is my mic on? Uh, I, can okay. I think you Okay, now I'm good. Um, yeah, I, so absolutely like the, the, the same sort of techniques that we use to generate these suffixes, 
Um, it's, it's not a huge leap to, to take those and you know, apply them to basically prompt formats that have function calls and function responses in them. Um, and you know, essentially what you're looking for is you know, what, what does the, the rag retrieval need to come up with in order for me to break alignment. Um, there are some computational issues there, like the amount of memory that you need is probably gonna be uh, more than, than uh, quite a bit more than, than what, what you know, we had to deal with with the chatbot scenarios. Um, but I think you know, that's not, that's not a, a game uh, show stuff or anything. Um, you know, there are some interesting, interesting uh, directions that people have started to pursue here in, in trying to like, build smarter AIs that themselves can do uh, a lot of this like, prompt engineering and, and attack work. Um, at first, I really didn't have very much hope for that. I, like, <laughs> it, it just seemed like uh, um, you know d a bit too random to, to really be effective. But um, I'm I'm a, a, a bit more of a believer now than than I was uh, four or five months ago. You know, just having tried it myself and and like seen it working on frontier models. Um, you know, I, I think that there is there is some room there. Um, that's great. By the way, uh, if the audience has questions, you can start lining up so that I have an idea of how much time I should give uh, the audience questions. I have a few of my own. Uh, one, th one thing I want to sort of highlight is that I've been doing this research on adversarial attacks as well uh, for a while. And for computer vision models and the older generation of models, uh, they were all, they always made for really great demos, but when we actually talked to security leaders, they were like, we don't really care about these attacks because we don't see them as being the practical first thing that they will go after. Uh, especially when it was about computer vision models. What has changed with large language models where it, which makes you believe that actually these attacks are now practical and imminent and something that enterprises really need to care about? Yeah, um, I, it's an excellent excellent point and, and uh, I had very much the same reaction talking to people who are responsible for, de for deploying AI. Like, why do I care about pooling the, the vision classifier when I can put like a traffic cone over the camera on a self-driving car or something, right? Um, I think, you know, <laughs> the, the main thing that, that has changed is just the diversity of ways that people are using language models in, in applications. It's not a sort of one-off self-contained task that you're relying on, on the learned functionality for. You know, in, in a lot of cases, people are starting to use language models almost as like a drop-in replacement for complicated you know, functionality that they just didn't want to implement themselves, right? Like, I'll just make a call to, you know, Phi 3 or something that's pretty cheap. Um, it, it does a serviceable job at giving me uh, a result, so that's, that's my solution now. Um, uh, I, I think that, that trend will continue to grow, and, and um, that's certainly a problem. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if this explains uh, the general interest in like this work that, that we've seen from people, but the, the, the fact that these models are, are being used to build much more independent kind of agentic right. systems, um, I think is absolutely, uh, uh, you know, a distinguishing factor between adversarial attacks on language models and, and vision models. Um, but really, like, you know, how many people have themselves played with a computer vision model or like tried to, you know, work with uh, a ResNet to classify ImageNet or something? Like, that's a very small community. Um, the number of people who have played with ChatGPT, I mean, this is like the fastest application to reach 100 million users, right, in the history of, of, uh, you know, of, of, things, the yeah, internet, yeah. of everything. Um, so, you know, people themselves have, have played with the technology, uh, gotten a feel for it, understood it, maybe gotten frustrated when, like, it refused to answer a question that they thought was you know, perfectly fine or appropriate, um, and, and sort of seeing that just kind of work. Uh, yeah. you know, it surprised me that these attacks would transfer to ChatGPT. Yeah. I mean, we, we derived the attacks on seven and 13 billion parameter models that had completely different tokenizers, kind of on a technical level, like the vocabularies are, are different. 100%, not 100%, but very different between um, you know, OpenAI's models and Google's models and so forth and the ones that we were looking at. Uh, the fact that that works is mysterious and interesting and you know, if, if you uh, have any belief that, that uh, these, these models are gonna play a larger role in, right. in products in our lives, you know, then 
I think that certainly uh, gives you some some pause. Right. Yeah. So when you took these results and as part of responsible disclosure, I'm sure you first went to OpenAI and Anthropic. Were they worried, or did Anthropic go like, oh, we only get beaten like 2%, so we are good and we are gonna use this as a win <laughs> against OpenAI? How was their reaction? Uh, I mean, they, they were all appropriately concerned. And, and to be clear, like we, we disclosed this, uh, disclosed the paper and the results and the strings that we found and everything um, to like the safety leads at OpenAI and Anthropic and all the, place, all the model providers that we attacked. Um, yeah, th they were very appreciative. Uh, I didn't. I didn't sense any gloating from right. Anthropic about the two percent number, but okay. they had the right to if, if they wanted. Um, yeah. yeah, and and I, you know I think to varying degrees, uh, those companies are working to try and mitigate okay. uh, the issue. They, they have fundamentally different approaches. Mm -hmm. We'll see. We'll see how it how Which it uh, plays out. Yeah. But yeah, they're uh, they were definitely interested and and uh, took it seriously and. And didn't want it to uh, just shove it under the carpet. Yep. Yep. Um, I'll have one more question, then I'll ask. Come, come to the first uh, audience question. One thing that I have struggled with when it comes to <coughs> sort of conversation with, and you know, most of the audience here obviously has, in one way or another, uh, been involved with security. A lot of you are probably involved in security engineering and protecting your organizations. The the challenge I've had is that. The, the, mo the mental model for understanding LLMs is still, I feel, to be not appreciated enough in the sense that people see these problems um, as additive, that, okay, I find, found a problem in the model, I'm gonna go fix it, but, and just like classical software engineering, I can keep on fixing bugs by bugs, and reg regression is quite limited. Um, one thing that happens in models is that every single fine-tuning or retraining that you do is a, an override operation on your previous parameters. And a big concern that people don't appreciate it is that if, let's say, I, even if I take your secure model and I fine tune that model on my data or I do something else with it that changes the parameters, I could in some sense break whatever happened before, the model could regress. So how should we go about securing these models or how should we treat these models in a way? Should we never fine tune or if we want to do it, do we need to keep on doing these kinds of testing? How should we go about yeah. securing enterprise models? Yeah, I, that's an excellent question. And, and you're right, it's, it's so every, every change that you make you know, during fine tuning, even if you say I only fine tune on like 10 examples or something, um, you know, unless you're <laughs> doing like you know, parameter efficient fine tuning yeah. or something like, you're changing every single weight in the model. You didn't really understand what all that functionality did before you right. did the fine tune, right? It's a seven billion or 13 or however large, it's a fantastically complex function. Um, you never had a full understanding of it. Your understanding of how it behaves is purely data driven, right? You don't have a sort of you know, closed form uh, expression that can tell you what the model is going to do. Um, so y you have to understand it through test cases, regression tests, right? right? Um, and and uh, 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 yeah, I, I think, you know, certainly, um, if <laughs> uh, this is sort of why I was calling for, con you know, continuous integration of adversarial testing uh, throughout development. Right. Um, you might think that you've only made the model more secure. I've just sort of trained it to refuse on this prompt that it, you know, was previously getting fooled by. Um, but you, you most likely did cause regressions on things that you were secure on before. Right? And unless you are specifically testing for that and, and testing adversarially, right. you're very unlikely to find that that is the case. Right. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think like you, you, wanna be, you wanna be tracking the, the security of the model to sort of the full scope of, of uh, like kind of threat environments and threat models that you think it might be exposed to um, just the way that you would track the model's capability and, right. and so forth. Um, so sort of yeah. an integration with the model development process, I'm sure that the AI scientists would love that coming from the security teams. Let's take the, take the first uh, audience question. Yeah, introduce awesome. yourself and, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you said introduce myself? I mean, yeah, uh, or ask the question. My name is Liam. Uh, probably leave my employer out of this for a moment just because of conf potential conflicts of interest. Uh, so it's kind of a two-part question. One is, so realistically in the field, you don't see people or customers interact directly with LLMs, they do so through an API. So this is kind of like a new extension of the injection attack. And my question is like, 
should we as an industry be considering like new layers of like traditional input validation that are like more focused on AI prompts, like maybe putting like an NLP or a less capable language model in front of these prompts that's like looking for the bad thing and trying to detonate them? Yeah, yeah, that's an, an excellent, excellent question. And I, mean, I, I think that is what a lot of, a lot of model providers like the you know, kind of larger uh, companies are, are doing to some extent is putting AIs in front of the AI to sort of validate and maybe rewrite prompts and, and do things like that. Um, the, the central issue with that, of course, is <laughs> you know, the, the, the AI that I'm standing up to protect my first AI, right, mm -hmm. might itself have the same vulnerabilities. And so then the attacker's objective isn't just I want to I want to cause the target model to do a bad thing, I want to cause the guard AI to you know pass the prompt through and and not modify it, um, and then cause the target model to do something bad, um, and that is absolutely possible to do in in a white box setting. I think it's going to be a lot harder in black box, yeah. um, but you know it it, it doesn't like it's not a fundamental solution to the problem in the way that finding a way to unconfuse uh, the core AI in the beginning would have been uh, anyway. So like you, you have to have a good story for why that, that guard AI is, is more robust, more secure than your target model, and I think in order for that to, to like really continue to make sense. Yeah, of course, thank you, and concerning. And second question is, uh, is yourself or maybe other people in the research, uh, like security research industry looking at like, like token context uh, attacks on LLMs, because like, I've been able to make ChatGPT4 do some like pretty awful things by like saying do all, do all these things and like selectively removing things and like it's, it's a whole different breed of attack. It's not <laughs> like yours, but it's like it's, you know, make, make it draw children doing unsafe things and then you just massage the prompt until you get what it wants and it's like horrifying in a sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there, there's a really nice paper um, out of Microsoft fairly recently uh, this attack that they called crescendo, mm -hmm. and you know, if I understood what you were saying uh, correctly, that it, you know, the idea was start by asking the model innocuous questions, but about the concept or whatever it is that you wanted to do. You know, what's the history of bomb making, right? And then just kind of like slowly ratchet up the the degree of specificity that you're asking for, um, and that's that's very effective on the current current batch of yeah, exactly, uh, language yeah. models. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, thank you so much. Appreciate yep. your time. Thank you. Um, let me now maybe um, ask one more question, which is slightly a controversial question. Uh, and I'll, I hope everybody understands and appreciates the, the well, at least the complexity of it. Your attack requires open source models and the weights that, you're, that are available to you to use the gradients and so on. And then you take these attacks and you transfer them to a closed source model, right? And as I understand, the ability for you to launch an attack against a model whose weights are known to you is much easier than transferring those to a closed source model. Yeah. Are we more insecure if you use open source models as opposed to uh, closed source models? And does that kind of insecurity in some sense create a very weird power dynamic that basically takes away attention for security reasons away from open source models, which I generally believe are a force of good? Yeah. yeah. And Absolutely excellent point. Um, so you know, it maybe didn't come out entirely well from that chart, but uh, for a transfer attack. So if my goal is to attack a proprietary closed source model that I don't have the weights for, um, you know, that's, that's a fairly stochastic, you know, the outcome is, is not, is not uh, totally certain, especially for like the quads and, and things like that. Um, if I have access to the weights, then it's a much more definite non-stochastic, mm -hmm. like I can, I can pretty much do it every time. Um, unless you've taken steps to make the model more robust intentionally. Um, so uh, absolutely, if, if, uh, if, if you, you know, do a lot of work to make a secure model and then throw it up on Hugging Face or whatever uh, op open repository um, for others to benefit from, you, you are making yourself less secure. Yes. Um, it, especially in cases where like, maybe I fine tune a small model and I want to use it as a guard, uh, people will, you know, <laughs> find, find a way to yeah. go, go and it's past. not expensive. Like you, you can do it with an A10G, right. um, 24 gigabyte, you know, instance, uh, and find an attack fairly quickly. Um, so it is a weird kind of dynamic uh, for the time being. But I am optimistic that um, you know we started with Llama 3 and Open Model. We can easily find attacks for it, uh, but then we were able to train it and and get a model that you know. 
we couldn't find any attacks on right. or white box. Right. Um, and, and I would feel pretty good about then using that open source model um, sort of for whatever purpose, as a guard or whatever on my infrastructure. Um, right. Yeah, so I'm, I'm optimistic that, you know, we might not always be in this world where we have to. <laughs> right, and, and obviously there are a lot of other benefits that come with open source models being your ability to kind of fine tune them and even know what kind of alignment already exists. Uh, let's take the second audience question. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, question is very similar to the gentleman who asked the question beforehand. Um, the solution that actually came to my mind was that if we can determine the adversarial suffix with the uh, white box LLMs, um, is, is that a finite list? Um, meaning, can we actually put filters in the actual calls to the LLMs? Just like, you know, malware, signature malwares work. Uh, or is it that it's just completely infinite list based on what you're writing in the prompt and that's why you can't control it? Because one, one thing that I couldn't understand was, especially when you were explaining how you reached out to OpenAI, et cetera, uh, if this is also the solution, right, that you actually get the adversarial suffix and then filter those out, why wouldn't they just do it on their own models? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, so to, to answer your first question, it's, it's open. Like, I, I don't know whether it's a finite list. Uh, it, I, like, my hunch would be that it isn't, especially because models change over time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the list depends on the model, so as, as you're making updates, Whatever, if it was a finite list before, then you got, you and got switch into it. So the list also depends on the size of the adversary suffix that you're willing to put, right? You could yes, put in it does, very yeah. long suffix. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yep, it, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Might be finite for a fixed For a fixed yeah. length, yeah. Um, but it's a larger question, like, you know, can I, can I just sort of initially, uh, f you know, find a pretty good uh, collection of all the suffixes that other people are likely to find and then filter directly on those? Um, <laughs> I think it depends a lot on the first question. Um, some, so OpenAI did, did block the suffixes that we shared with them, and like you get a little red dialog box whenever we went back and tried to submit them. Um, but you know, we were generally able to make uh, small changes to the, to the suffixes that would get past whatever filter they had in place, and then you know, the thing would still work and the model would, would still break. So it, it seems like not a great uh, approach unless you can do a really comprehensive job of it. Um, and, and I don't, I don't know, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, so rather than filtering on the suffixes like a, like a malware scanner might, um, I think probably the, the more promising thing to do with those is to fold them back into your training in the right way, um, sort of teach the model uh, that it, it shouldn't it shouldn't get tripped up by weird collections of tokens at the end, um, and, and hope that it generalizes uh, to, to new suffixes that you haven't seen. And that does seem to be what what's happened on Llama three uh, so far for us. All right, let's, thank you. Let's take the next one. Yep. Hi, this is Ashra from h 2 So my question is, um, how would you classify these attack vectors if they're classifiable at this point in time? Uh, can and we just also get the second question so that we can then answer both of them because oh, we're sure. running out yeah. of time. Yeah. Yeah. So a great presentation, thank you. So regarding the paper, so were you able to extract some private information from the model or no? Yeah. Both, both good questions. And, and so the, the first one you were asking about how do we classify the... the Yes, yeah, it, it, it could be by means of weaknesses, or you could have a different way of classifying attacks. Oh, yes, uh, so I, I, the way that I would, th the, yeah, the way I think of this attack, this is a great question, it, it's not prompt injection, right? Prompt injection is an attack where I'm, I'm putting instructions into, into a return that makes it under the head. Um, you know, prompt injection is pure form I think you can train around, right? Uh, you can do alignment and teach the model not to, not to follow instructions that come in data. Um, I think of this as, as, a, as a bypass on the use of training and alignment as a policy enforcement mechanism. So jailbreaking. It, yeah, it's, yeah, essentially like a jailbreak, jailbreak. Yep. an automated jailbreak. Okay. And for the second question, uh, so we haven't done, like, I haven't done memorization studies with this, um, but we have done a bit of like, you know, get the model to give us long form copyrighted content. Uh, that works some of the time, uh, so it does seem like a promising thing. You might be able to sort of test for private information leakage using something right. like thank this. Thank you. Yep. All right, everyone, whoever is left in the room, please thank <laughs> Matt for this great talk and great, great work.